It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative for August of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said, no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time, Bombay, today, Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is, is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you gonna do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not gonna use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Well, it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? 
they melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're, they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate. And it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I'm just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the US. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. You know, we got through 1998. We got through the dot-com crash. We got through 2008. We got through 2020 and COVID. Uh, there was a, actually a good size uh, market drawdown in 2018 between October 1st, 2018 uh, and Christmas Eve, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock markets dropped 20% in, uh, in under three months uh, when the Fed kept raising interest rates, even though the economy was weakening. So they have seen those, but every single time it came back, even in COVID, uh, March, April, 2020, the stock market went down 30%. It did, I mean, just almost straight down. But by September, we were back to new all-time highs. And so it's not that they've never seen that kind of volatility, but they learned the wrong lesson, which is it always comes back. And we know why, because the Fed bails you out, the Fed floods the zone with money, the Fed talks it up, you know, et cetera. But the, the counter example in 1929, when the stock market did crash, it was down 23% over two days. It was like a 12% day. 
and an 11% day in uh, late October 1929, but it kept going. <laughs> the stock market crashed in October 1929, but it bottomed in June 1932. That was a three year moving crash or rolling crash, whatever you want to call it, with some rallies along the way. And the total uh, damage was over 80%, not 30%, not 40%, down 80%. And what people don't know, uh, many people don't know, is you said, okay, you know, then, it, then it rallied in 1933 and 1934. The Fed messed up again and blundered again, as they usually do in 1937, and threw us into a double dip. But if you ask people, okay, well, everyone knows the stock market crashed in 1929. When did it regain those highs? How long did that take? The answer is 25 years. It was 1954 before right. the market recovered from 1929. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't gains along the way or you couldn't make money, you could. But if you say, oh, I'll just sit tight and wait till it comes back. Well, a lot of people didn't live long enough. They never saw their, their money back because they didn't live 25 more years. So that's a real bear market. It's happened before. And the, the point is uh, you need to be prepared for things like that. And there are no one alive, but very few people alive have have seen anything like that and if you say well what if we had another market crash right now we'll talk about reasons why in a second um why could the fed just come right back in and you know print some more money and do the same thing over again and bail out the new failures whoever they may be yeah you, know, you can just kind of keep bailing things out why not do it again you know, what's the what's the big deal well the answer is each bailout is bigger than the one before and that's the point. You can go all the way back 1994, Mexico, 1998, Russia, LTCM, 2000, dot com, 2008, Lehman, 2020, pandemic. And they do bail out, but each one's bigger than the one before. I mean, we threw out six or seven trillion dollars of new debt on top of a one trillion dollar a year baseline, seven trillion dollars in new debt to kind of dig our way out of uh, of 2020. So there is a, there is a limit. There comes a time it's like, hey, this, this bail is going to be 20 trillion you know sorry that's uh, that check's too big we're gonna have to let some things fail so what could happen um the the first thing on my list is uh we're heading for a very uh severe recession i just want to uh, kind of explain briefly the dynamics of that so the fed's raising interest rates we know that they started you know it, so it wasn't that long ago but march 1st 2022 the fed policy rate was zero it was zero percent uh, people remember Paul Volcker. Oh, Paul Volcker raised interest rates to 20%. Well, he did, but so far, Powell hasn't raised them as high, but he's raised them fast. I mean, even when Volcker was working his way to 20%, it took three years from 1979 to 1982. So Powell's plan is clear because he's told us. He said inflation is job one. You know, it's not that we don't care, but unemployment is going to go up. We're going to have a recession. He doesn't use the R word, by the way, but it's implicit in everything he says. We are going to have a recession. Unemployment is going up. And too bad. It's kind of too bad because we got to get inflation under control. And so the Fed is in search of something that they call the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? The terminal rate is a rate that's high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. So it doesn't have to be higher than inflation. It has to be high enough to cause inflation to come down to the Fed's goal of 2% without hiking more. And when they get there to that terminal rate, they'll sit tight, they call it the pause. And the pause could be a year. And Powell said this, again, this is right out of his script. So um, Powell's in search of the terminal rate. By the way, if you said to me, hey Jim, what's the terminal rate? I would answer truthfully, I would say, I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. Jay Powell doesn't know what the terminal rate is. He's, he's kind of saying, we'll know it when we see it, but we're not there yet and we're gonna keep going. And um, they, they have what they call the DOTS, silly name, but the members of the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Bank presidents give estimates or the, you know, their estimates of unemployment, inflation, growth, and interest rates for the next three years. Uh, and they put them as dots on a chart, so they call it the dots. Uh, and then, you know, Wall Street gets the dots, they do a central tendency and regressions and all this stuff. One of the top Fed insiders, like practically sits in Jay Powell's lap and has all the way back to Bernanke and Yellen, told me personally, he said, inside the Fed, they regard the dots as a joke. They're not better than guesses. Their forecasting ability is dismal. You or I would have better forecasts and they wish they could get out of it, but they don't know how. So that's the truth, but the problem is, Wall Street and the financial media and the talking heads on CNBC, they want to talk about the dots and it does affect market behavior. So even though it's a joke, 
even though the forecasts are terrible, you have to pay attention because it affects the markets. And if you're affecting the markets, and you're on the wrong side, you're going to get run over. So I look at the dots, not because I put weight on them as predictive analytic tools, but because the market pays attention. The market says, hey, inflation is already coming down. And so the market says, hey, you did it. You're, you know, you're already there. Inflation is coming down. Why don't you stop? And by the way, you're going to get the message. The economy is going to be slowing down. Inflation is going to be coming down. And then you're going to cut rates. This is the famous pivot. Whenever you hear of the Fed pivot, that's when the Fed turns around and starts cutting rates instead of raising them. And that'll be just in time and growth will slow, but it won't be too bad. And we'll come in for soft landing. And this is the Goldilocks scenario. Uh, so again, typical Wall Street, get the pom poms out. The Fed's going to cut rates and so buy stocks. That's all Wall Street knows is buy stocks. But the conundrum is, is inflation coming down because the Fed is still hiking? Or is the inflation coming down because they're at the terminal rate? Well, we don't know. It's kind of hard to sort those things out. Powell would say, yeah, it's coming down. I know that, of course, but I got it. It's, it's because I'm hiking and I'm going to keep doing it. My view is, no, you you actually did it. It's mission accomplished. You just don't know it. That means, as usual, they're going to screw it up. They're going to blunder. They're going to go too far. And the, it's not going to be a mild recession. It's not going to be Goldilocks. In this version, Goldilocks gets eaten by the bears. In other words, you're going to throw this economy into a very deep recession because you're going to go too far, as usual. And you're not going to know it until uh, too, too late. By the time you realize you've it's mission accomplished, you will have gone too far too long. Rates are going to be too high and it's not going to be a soft landing. If Wall Street's talking up the stock market based on the soft landing Goldilocks scenario, but Powell's going to stick to his guns and, and, and raise rates too high, that's going to cause stocks to crash very severely, very suddenly. If, if the market were adjusting, say, yeah, Powell means it, uh, he's going to keep it, and we ought to come down a little bit. That would be one thing, but that's not what's happening. The market's trying to rally. Powell's warning people what's going to happen. They're not listening, and it is going to happen. People hear the government say, you know, the economy's fine or, you know, unemployment's near an all-time low, you know, which is actually statistically is, is true. And they, they kind of nod and go, yeah, it's all good. And then reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four. You know, the propaganda is um, positive. We can talk about that in a little more detail. The reality is harsh um, and reality wins. Um, and there's a very good book um, on this um by Robert Schiller, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale University. I'm not a huge fan of your garden variety PhD economist, but there are some good ones out there and he's one of them. He wrote a book about, oh, two years ago, maybe a little bit less called Narrative Economics. Uh, he said, yeah, we got all the models and uh, Phillips curve and uh, wealth effect and uh, uh, you know, various you know, quantity theory of money. And you know, some have a place, some are more valuable than others. But uh, don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's basically a, it's a fancy name for a story, but a story that, that persists, that grows. Uh, and interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SEIR model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? E for exposed. Are you exposed to it? I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? Um, the difference between I and R are people who died. But it's it's a model and it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics um, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, but just to something that spreads. And uh, it can be very powerful and then eventually may die out or reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. Um, that much I knew, but what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful, but a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. He gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions, but there was a period from 1929 to 1933, uh, election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then there was another period from 1933 to 1937, the 37 and 1940 part, we leave aside for this purpose. 
But during the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, 19, was elected in 1933, became president in 1934, the psychology turned 180 degrees, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the Democratic campaign saw was happy days are here again, and, you know, FDR seemed to solve the banking crisis and so forth, and all of a sudden it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%. Well, 15% is still you know painfully high, but it was a, a big move in the right direction. So he, he describes how the narrative flip from don't spend money, it's poor form to, yeah, go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in, in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model, but it doesn't fit into any of the standard uh, macroeconomic models, but it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative and they're failing badly, but they'll say, if you listen to deliberations among White House officials, you know, some of the stuff leaks to the press and some, I know some of these people, it's like the economy's great, unemployment's really low, um, it, it's we've created all these jobs since the pandemic, but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is they're inside the White House, they're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out. The, the correct analysis is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. Uh, you, and this is why I say the propaganda from the White House of things are great is at odds with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, the, if everything, is great until February 27th, and then Russia invades, and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. Um, so it predates the war, number one. Number two, oh, gee, energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine. It's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know, somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada, then uh, ended new leasing, uh, oil and gas exploration leasing of federal lands, handicapped the fracking industry, took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, et cetera, to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course, but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from $40 to $120 in, in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, huh, 
guess we need more oil. And uh, he, so he wants to reopen leasing. I said they shut it down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere. And we're begging him for oil. So why don't we drill our own oil? Because uh, we were a net exporter up until 2021. And then Biden came in and we lost that edge and became a net importer, including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. Uh, so you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now, that's another fantasy. It, it won't happen. I could, we don't have time to go through all the physics of it. Uh, and, you know, output of energy by weight, com gasoline compared to batteries and the pollution of batteries and the fact that, you, you know, you, you got to, we don't have the charging stations. And even if we did, where's that electricity coming from? Oh, coal. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Another example of propaganda versus reality. You know, narratives are pow powerful, but reality is more powerful. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time, times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. The largest, most sophisticated, biggest player, real money market in the world is telling you that the Fed's going to blink, that they're going to raise rates, but then things are going to get so bad, they're going to have to cut rates. And that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance. I haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, the stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is going to play out, it'll get worse as the year goes on. Inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This, this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. This is going to be part of what throws the economy into a severe recession. They're raising rates and inflation is coming down. But what they don't know is, are interest rates coming down because they're raising rates? Or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it? And that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening, which they are, they are going to over tighten, probably already have it. The energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada, into the United States, where it would connect at a hub uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from forty dollars to one hundred twenty dollars in in under a year. The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, of natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers 
behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived in the seventies, um, where, you know, Hey, I better buy it today. I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question, but is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want. Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone, sooner than later pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's gonna cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates, inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking. And the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months. And you didn't have to ask, they would just give it to you because they knew that you were gonna quit if, if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and then I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, a TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects between 77 and 81. So that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not gonna spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, oh, well, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better better spend the money fast because it's it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and in inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd, uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer of electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the US economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen.
It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets. And I start my analysis in 1971 and I don't have to go through all, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or, you know, machine guns or something, but foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. The British sovereign is, is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you gonna do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not gonna use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign? That's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971 when we decouple completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War One. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold. Um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Well, it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK, or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? 
they melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're, they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate and it's valued at 11 billion dollars but that's because they value the gold at 42 dollars an ounce if you and i've revalued it the answer is that today's market that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion so the fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate but it's not the gold the treasury has the gold and by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold a thousand tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. Uh, if you look at yield curves, look at the Treasury yield curve, Euro dollar futures yield curve, German Bunds yield curve, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, in 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's gonna get the memo, they're gonna cut rates, the pivot and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no. This is bad and it's gonna get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the Euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. 
So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay. The, um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, two year notes or five year notes or whatever. They will come down a lot, not right away. It's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot. And then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession, because of deterioration, increased bankruptcies, reduced revenues, you know, et cetera. So those spreads will blow out. And it's important to remember, um, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. Uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not moving anything by truck. So there are certain businesses that are concurrent. The yield curves I was talking about are very good forward indicators. They tell you what's going to happen next. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits. And the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards, they stop doing loans. And then interest rates will start to come down. Interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, you know, even the treasury market. So that's not unusual. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs. There's all kinds of statute, you know, SEC. So if I'm going to fire 10,000 people, I got to tell the world I'm firing 10,000 people. It doesn't mean I fire them that day. I might fire them you know, on a rolling basis over the next 30 days. And it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up, but that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, 1% a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. 
but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened, and they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it's like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level.